panelists, you can switch on your cameras. We are um, we are going to start, even though there's still people filing in. I think that we can just sort of uh, begin. Hello, everybody. Hi. So uh, I see that we're still we still have quite a few uh, people who are filing in. Um, so I'm just going to let people do that for a bit as we begin our event. It's great to see you, Jonathan, Karen, Eve. I'm really looking forward to this evening together with you. We're just letting a few more people uh, come into the into the Zoom room before we begin, um, but we'll be able to get started very very shortly. All right. I think that the uh, I think that the numbers are stabilizing and and, uh, and we can begin. So uh, my name is Bianca. Um, I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. Um, so, so pleased to be here today. Um, we are also live to Facebook. So please do uh, share uh, this event on Facebook. Uh, it's facebook.com slash Canada policy. Um, you can also find out more about the host organization, uh, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute at foreignpolicy.ca, as well as Just Peace Advocates at justpeaceadvocates.ca. So we're here with Jonathan Kutab, with Eve Angler, with Karen Rodman for our event, the innumerable ways that Canada supports Israeli apartheid and what we can do about it. Um, so I just want to give a huge welcome to our panelists. I want to give a huge welcome to all of you at home for joining us, for tuning in live. Um, I'm delighted to be hosting this critical discussion with uh, Jonathan and Eve and Karen who've been doing so much work on this issue. So again, my name is Bianca Majeni. I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute and I'm one of the organizers of this event. Um, please find out more about the amazing work that Just Peace Advocates is doing, justpeaceadvocates.ca. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this event is also being live streamed uh, to our Facebook. Um, so before we begin our event, I just want to acknowledge that we are gathered here today. I am, I'm personally in Montreal, the island of Montreal, which is Dojage, and it's situated on the traditional territory of the Ganyangahaga people um, and the keepers of the Eastern door of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, it's wonderful to see this turnout. Um, and uh, I actually, if there's, if anyone can actually post in the chat the uh, the Facebook event, that would be awesome because um, you, you can then share that. Um, we also, as you can see, the chat is open, um, and we'd love to hear from you. So please do say hi. Let us know where you're coming from. Hi, Furkan. Um, and uh, as always, please uh, refrain from you know any any racist, sexist, or otherwise harmful commentary. Please uh, please do keep your comments civil and cordial. And after our speakers give their opening remarks, we'll be opening up to questions. Hi, Robert in Montreal. Um, and so there is a Q and A box where you can actually put your questions. So we'll get to as many of those as we can, time permitting. So again. Um, I'm here representing the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, and we're an organization that challenges unjust foreign policy measures. And our goal is to bridge the gap between the perception and the reality of Canada's role in the world. We also work to oppose the racism that's embedded in Canadian foreign policy. And you can find out more uh, about the work that we do at foreignpolicy.ca. Um, and if you like events like these, um, please do consider donating or becoming a sustainer. Um, and the link for that is foreignpolicy.ca slash donate. And, uh, and we'll be putting all those links in the chat. Hi, Simon in Ottawa. Hi, William. Um, so uh, our work, what we're working towards is a progressive foreign policy and the internationalism that we all need to embrace so urgently must include meaningful international solidarity. This includes support for anti-racist and anti-colonial uh, movements globally. And this week is a pretty significant week for us. It marks a year since the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute was launched with, uh, with an op-ed in the Toronto Star, the public letter opposing Canada's bid for a seat on the United Nations Security Council. And we worked with our co-sponsors of today's event, uh, Just Peace Advocates, on the No to UNSC campaign, which included sending over 2,000 individual emails 
to all UN ambassadors critical of Canada's anti-Palestinian record. And in a sign of its effectiveness, it forced Canada's permanent representative to the UN to send a letter to all other UN ambassadors actually defending Canadian policy on Palestinian rights. Among um, the elements of Canada's anti-Palestinian record that we highlighted, um, where we highlighted the current Liberal government's uh, voting record at the UN, our current Liberal government have voted against more than 50 UN resolutions upholding Palestinian rights. Um, and these are resolutions that are supported by almost every other nation on earth. We also highlighted how our foreign minister, Christian Freeland at that time, asserted that Canada would quote, act as an asset for Israel if it gained a seat on the United Nations Security Council. And you know, many progressives considered our position against Canada's bid for UNSC seat controversial, but time has really borne it out. And in recent days, Norway and Ireland, Canada's two competitors for a seat uh, on, on the council have sought to stop Israeli violence through the council unfortunately blocked by Washington, they put out a statement with other Security Council members, France and Estonia, condemning recent Israeli airstrikes and calling on Israel to cease settlement activities, demolitions and evictions. It's highly unlikely that the Trudeau government would have, would have pursued a similar tack if it had won a Security Council seat. So internationalism. Internationalism means that we cannot ignore the biggest injustices taking place on the planet. And a major way that we living in Canada can contribute to the Palestinian struggle is to challenge our own government, to challenge them to apply their laws on foreign enlistment, their own laws on charities, challenge them to vote with the rest of the world on UN resolutions upholding Palestinian rights, uh, as well as many more actions that uh, our esteemed panelists will be underlining in today's talk. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first panelist of the evening, Jonathan. Kutab. Jonathan is the co-founder of Palestinian Human Rights Group, Al-Haq, and uh, co-founder of Nonviolence International. He's the author of the recently released book, Beyond the Two-State Solution, an international human rights lawyer. Um, he serves on the board of Bethlehem Bible College and is president of the Holy Land Trust. Jonathan was head of the legal committee negotiating the Cairo Agreement of the 1994 um, of the 1990, uh, in 1994 between Israel and the PLO. And after graduating from Virginia Law School and practicing on Wall Street for, for a bit, Jonathan returned home to Palestine. He was a visiting scholar at Osgoode Law School uh, at York University in Toronto in the fall of 2017, and is a founding director of Just Peace Advocates. He's, uh, he's resident of uh, East Jerusalem, where he's a partner at Kitab, Curry, and Hannah Law Firm, um, and has just written an excellent book, and we'll be putting the link uh, to that and to his work in the chat. I get a copy of Jonathan's recent book, Beyond the Two-State Solution, if you can. It is excellent. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to speak to such a large uh, group of Canadians who are interested in foreign policy. Uh, as, as, as I said before, I came to Canada, I used to think of Canada as being similar to the United States, except more liberal and more progressive and, and more decent. Uh, and unfortunately, on the issue of Palestine, uh, the Canadian government has not been at all uh, progressive or decent or, or, or even following uh, international law as it should. Uh, but uh, I, I'm going to leave most of the discussion of Canada uh, to Eves, who will be talking after me. And, and, and I wanted to bring everybody uh, up to date as to what is happening now in Palestine and what is the importance of what's happened in the last uh, two weeks. Uh, because I really think, at least judging from where I am currently in the United States, uh, I think we may be close to a tipping point, at least where the entire conversation around Israel-Palestine uh, is moving. Uh, and, and let me explain uh, a little bit more. Uh, until these two weeks, most people who thought or talked or worked on the Israel-Palestine question you know, were caught up in the issue of two states. And we're caught up in what's happening in the West Bank, in Gaza, and maybe also East Jerusalem. Uh, 
uh, caught up in the idea of settlements being an obstacle to creating a Palestinian state in a small part of Palestine, 22%. What we saw during these last two weeks was that the reality is different. The reality is that the Palestinian question is not limited to the West Bank in Gaza. The reality is that in our confrontation with the Zionist movement, Israel has succeeded in bifurcating and fragmenting the Palestinian people to five different groups and in having a separate policy for each group. First, there were those who are uh, Palestinians or Israeli citizens. There's about two million of them. They have the right to vote in Israel, but they really have zero political power because they are told this is a Jewish state. Yeah, you have the right to vote, but your representatives in the Knesset have no authority over anything. Uh, because this is a Jewish state and only Jews have the right to self-determination uh, in this state. And any action or law or regulation or practice or policy that favors Jews over non-Jews is the most natural thing because this is intended to be a Jewish state. So basically, by its very nature, it is an apartheid regime. But like other apartheid regimes, it doesn't, it's not only a two tier regime with one tier for Jews and a second tier for non-Jews. Here, they have succeeded in dividing the Palestinian people into five separate categories. I mentioned the first one are the Israeli citizens, uh, Palestinians or Israeli citizens. The second group are those in East Jerusalem about 300,000 of them. They are not even citizens. They are residents, but not citizens. And they have a, a strange status, clearly not at the status of Jews because Jerusalem was supposed to be unified and only for Jews when everybody knows Jerusalem is important for Palestinians as well, for Muslims and Christians. And we saw this during this week. A third group are those in the West Bank. And many people thought that that's all that Palestinians are. The people of the West Bank, which is 22% of Palestine, and it's being continuously taken up by Jewish settlements, and it's bifurcated into areas A, B, and C. Uh, and Mahmoud Abbas, who is supposed to be in charge of the Palestinians in the West Bank, is, is, really has to act according to what Israel wants him to act, otherwise he can do nothing. Then there are the people of Gaza, two million of them basically in an open air prison. And Israel is perfectly fine to treat all Gaza as if it was this illegal entity called Hamas. Even though Hamas is just a political party and most people in Gaza have never voted for anybody much less voted for Hamas. Yeah, but in, in Israeli propaganda terms, Hamas is the way that you demonize all of Gaza and, and justify everything that you are doing in Gaza. If you can show that one office in this building uh, has a Hamas member in it, we can knock down the whole building because there's Hamas there. So and th that's the fourth group. And the fifth group are the Palestinian refugees, those who are in the diaspora. Two thirds of the Palestinian people cannot even go to Palestine, to their homes, to their homeland. They can't even go to visit, much less to live there. They may be able to enter if they have a Canadian passport or they may be not, they may be turned back. So my point is, these events the last two weeks have shown that the Palestinian people are one people and they are united. And they are united in fighting a system which is an apartheid system that grants rights to Jews that it denies to non-Jews. That is the bottom line that needs to be understood 
and the press. And this is a Zionist phenomena, by the way, because many of the people who can see this best are our Jewish friends who recognize that this is an unfair and an unequal and an apartheid system. The second thing that was shown uh, uh, during these last two weeks is that with respect to Gaza, the situation is so terrible that even the ending of the bombardment does not really solve the problem. These people are living in an open air prison and the Israelis were pummeling them right and left mercilessly like, like fish in a barrel. Uh, one of the things that really got me was when one missile fell on a house and it didn't explode. And the neighbors got a call, sorry, there was a technical error, but we will be returning tonight to correct it and destroy that house. Because the Palestinians have no defense. They don't have an iron dome. They don't have uh, places to go and hide. When the, when the bombs start falling and the air raid sirens go off, where do you go? You don't have an air raid shelter. And not only that, you have nowhere to physically go somewhere else to take your children away or to take yourself to a safe place because there is no safe place. The entire Gaza Strip is about 170 square kilometers. Uh, when you think about that, two million people who are there, obviously every one of them is within striking distance of somebody who is a, an Israeli target and they have no defense and nowhere to go. So I think we really need to recognize that it's a good thing that the ceasefire took place and that there is no more aerial bombardment. But what we really need now is to lift the siege of Gaza, to allow people in Gaza to move in and out, to bring goods in and out. How can you repair the houses destroyed, all the houses that were destroyed, if you can't allow building materials in without Israeli permission and without Israeli permit? If you can't grow your food and export it, if you can't go out to sea and fish, if you can't have fuel for your generators for your electricity, if you can't have clean water and sewage, if you can't have your hospitals working without Israel controlling everything that's happened, we must lift the siege of Gaza. And, and finally, we must also bring Hamas into the equation. Hamas is a political party. I don't like it. I wouldn't vote for Hamas, but they are a political party and they serve a political function. And if you want to make peace, and if you want to do anything in Gaza, you must deal with Hamas. And right now they have almost more credibility than other people like President Abbas in Ramallah, I am sorry to say, they have more credibility than Mahmoud Abbas in Ramallah. So we must bring Hamas into the equation. There's the things that they need to do. There's conditions that need to be met, but Hamas must be part of any kind of arrangement or peace talk if peace is. Jonathan, and, and, you're and, on mute. And finally, and with this, I, I, I will end my 10 minutes. We need to think of ways to act if the government doesn't act. If the government of Canada continues on its policy, which is clearly against decency and against international law and in favor of apartheid, in favor of oppression, what can ordinary people do? This is where BDS becomes important. Boycotts, divestment, and calling for sanctions to punish those who violate international law, those who practice apartheid, those who refuse to accept equality, those who, while claiming to be defending themselves, are really oppressing and attacking everybody else. With this, I think I will stop and give a chance to other people and then 
and questions and answers we can deal with other issues. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for that um, really critical, very important summary of what's been happening on the ground uh, in Palestine and also what is needed right now from the international community, um, the need to lift the siege on Gaza. Um, so for everybody who is uh, tuning in at home, the links to Jonathan's new book and work can be found in the chat. And Jonathan, we look very forward to hearing more from you in the Q&A. So our next speaker is Eve Engler. He was an author and activist based in Montreal. He's the author of nine books on Canadian foreign policy, including the Black Book of Canadian Foreign Policy uh, and Canada and Israel Building Apartheid. His latest book is called House of Mirrors, Justin Trudeau's Foreign Policy. He was also a fellow and board member of the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. Welcome, Eve. Uh, thanks, thanks, Bianca. Can, uh, can people see me? Uh, no, your camera is not on. Let's see, uh, it's saying that the moderator needs to put the camera on. The host. Oh, okay. Let me help you out here. Just give me one second. So uh, just, just to start <laughs> off. Yeah, you can just you can start. I'll um, I'll ask to start. I think video. that works. Uh, there you I want to I want to acknowledge that I'm uh, speaking to you from traditional indigenous territory of uh, Joe Jage. Uh, which is a place that has long been a point of meeting and exchange among First Nations. Um, what I want to talk about is, uh, is the second most anti-Palestinian country in the world, which is Canada. Uh, and it is a, something that the Trudeau government, most of my talk is going to be about the Trudeau government. Uh, they have really continued what and uh, deepened in some areas what the Harper government had pursued of this extremist anti-Palestinian uh, pro-Israel policy. And, and I think it's important to point out, right, like in recent weeks, there's been all kinds of repression in Colombia, right wing government in Colombia that the Canadian government backs through a free trade agreement, through its diplomatic comments, through arms sales. Uh, and it's been rightfully protest against Canada's position uh, with what's going on in Colombia in recent days. But the relationship to Israel is not the sort of what I would call the typical support for a, a right wing, uh, you know, pro US uh, government in Latin America or elsewhere. It is unique. It is very unique. And there's many examples of just a, a uniquely uh, uh, pro-Israel, anti-Palestinian uh, position. Just before the, the, the recent uh, flare up of the tension on uh, uh, Israeli dispossession of Palestinians, the Canadian government pulled out of the uh, World Conference Against Racism. This is Justin Trudeau government that says it's a anti-racist government it pulled out of the World Conference Against Racism because the previous conference against racism had equated Zionism uh, with racism. Uh, you have the uh, Trudeau government sending a letter to the International Criminal Court telling them not to investigate Israeli war crimes last year and kind of implying that they may cut off funding to the International Criminal Court if they are to investigate Israeli war crimes. <coughs> Excuse me. You have the uh, Trudeau government appointing a special envoy to uh, back in November, largely designed to uh, uh, block criticism of Israeli apartheid. That envoy, Erwin Kotler, five days ago, spoke, was a keynote speaker at basically a pro-war rally, a rally organized by uh, an online rally by uh, uh, a Montreal uh, Jewish organization, basically applauding what Israel was doing in Gaza. He spoke from his apartment in Jerusalem. Uh, this is Canada's special envoy. Um, you have two years ago, the Trudeau government adopted a, a definition of, 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 of a form of xenophobia, largely designed to stop criticism of Israel's ongoing dispossession of Palestinians. Uh, you have uh, Trudeau himself repeatedly, repeatedly criticizing internationalist minded pro-Palestinian students. So political activity happening on the university campus and the prime minister of Canada condemning those who are on the right side of history. 
Um, you have uh, uh, the Trudeau government spending hundreds of thousands of dollars of taxpayer money on lawyers to block the proper labeling of a couple wines coming from illegal settlements because they don't want can Canadian consumers to know where those wines are actually coming from. And they're spending our tax dollars to block Canadian consumers from even being able to know where those wines are being produced. Uh, you have the Trudeau government expanding the Canada-Israel Free Trade Agreement, modernizing as they put it. Well, the Canada-Israel Free Trade Agreement includes, uh, applies Israeli customs laws to products produced in illegal settlements in the West Bank, which even the Canadian government officially, officially, ostensibly believes contravene uh, uh, international law. You have the Trudeau government adding to the criminalization of Palestinian political life, adding another Palestinian organization to Canada's terrorist list, which essentially makes all of Palestine, most of Palestinian political life illegal or criminal. Um, the only, the first group, Canadian-based group to ever be a point, to ever be enlisted was a, a, a Toronto-based, a Mississauga-based group, IRFAN, uh, International Re Relief Fund for the Afflicted and Needy. And they were listed as a Canadian terrorist organization because they were supporting orphans in Gaza. Uh, and they were channeling that money through the post office, which was under Hamas control because Hamas runs uh, Gaza. And they, and they tried to get a dialysis machine into Gaza. And the hospital that that was being sent to was under the health ministry, which is again under Hamas control. And they got listed as a, chair, as a terrorist organization in this country uh, for having tried to support orphans and a hospital in Gaza. And the Trudeau government, that, was, that began under the Harper government, the Trudeau government has continued, maintained Irfan uh, as a listed uh, uh, terrorist organization. In one of the most unbelievable acts of, uh, of exceeding deference to Israeli uh, violence, on, June 6, on January 16th of last year, Canada's ambassador in Israel organized a pizza party for Canadians fighting in the IDF, for fi Canadians fighting in the Israeli military, for Canadians overseeing checkpoints in the West Bank, uh, sniper fire into Gaza, uh, probably in recent days, uh, uh, you know, making decisions on bombings in Gaza. A pizza party for Canadians fighting in another country's military at the Canadian embassy in Tel Aviv. You have the Trudeau government allowing the enlistment of Canadians into the Israeli military, which contravenes the Foreign Enlistment Act, which is very clear. It's not legal to recruit or induce others to join another country's military. I know Karen's gonna get into this in more detail, but the Trudeau government has ignored the campaign that's brought this issue to light uh, and just tried to pass it off. Um, you have uh, the most important uh, form of Canadian support uh, for Palestinian dispossession for Israel uh, today and historically or in recent decades is the registered charities. Uh, more than a quarter billion dollars was raised in 2018 and a similar number each year since and before uh, uh, by registered Canadian charities for projects in Israel. And now a registered charity can provide a tax receipt. So depending on your tax bracket, depending on the size of donation, all kind of number of different criteria, usually about 30 to 40% of a donation uh, would be covered by the Canadian taxpayer by someone being able to pay less in tax to, to the Canadian government for, for, their, for their donation to uh, charity in, in, in Israel, a charity focused uh, projects in Israel. I recently went through the list of all the different charities uh, and it's really, it's fascinating. Uh, you have groups like the uh, uh, Canadian Friends of Israel Guide Dog Center for blind, for the blind. Uh, you have uh, Canadian Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel. Canadian Friends of the Isra Israel uh, Phil Philharmonic Orchestra. Uh, Canadian Friends of almost every university, every hospital, on and on and on, dozens, it probably into the hundreds of different organizations that are registered charities in this country that are supporting projects 
uh, uh, in Israel. In, in uh, 90, 1991, the Ottawa Citizens suggested there was more than $100 million raised for charities in Israel by Canadian groups, somewhere between 100 and 200 million. Like I said, the most recent number said a minimum of a quarter billion dollars. If you assume $100 million has been raised by registered Canadian charities for projects in Israel since 1967, when Canada brought in its, um, its modern charitable uh, rules around uh, donations, uh, providing tax receipts to donations, that's about $5.4 billion that's been raised for Israel by Canadian groups. And the Canadian taxpayer would have paid about $1.7 billion in lost, uh, lost tax revenue. Uh, I think that the, if you believe in boycott investment sanctions, obviously Canada should not be giving charitable status to groups that are supporting Israel. In fact, Canada should be moving to making all of the, those donations to Israel illegal. That would be real sanctions. Um, but we don't have to even get close to that before we can challenge a whole lot of the charitable donations going, going from Canada to Israel. Um, because in Canada, it's illegal. It's contrary to Canada Revenue Agency guidelines on charities to support groups that support another country's military. That's very explicit. It's also contrary to Canada Revenue Agency guidelines to support uh, projects in the West Bank that are supporting settlements that ostensibly contravene Canadian uh, uh, policy. And it's also, this is a bit more gray area, it, but should be the case um, to support explicitly racist organizations. Well, there's a whole bunch of the charities that are registered Canadian charities supporting projects in Israel that are supporting the Israeli military. So you have groups like uh, the Jewish National Fund of Canada has been shown to be supporting IDF projects. Uh, the the uh, Canadian Magan David Adam for Israel uh, has, uh, has been supporting IDF. Uh, the Bet, Bet Alochem Canada Aid to Dis Disabled Veterans of Israel also. The Hessek Foundation, which is a Toronto-based uh, registered charity that provided more than $9 million, $9.2 million in 2018, the last statistics I've seen. Um, the Hessek Foundation was set up to, quote, recognize and honor the contribution of lone soldiers to Israel. That's non-Israelis that join the Israeli mili military. Um, that seems pretty clearly a form of support to, to the Israeli military, but they're openly a registered charity. Uh, likewise, there's a number of organizations, registered charities that support settlement projects. You have the Jewish National Fund of Canada. It's been involved in all kinds of projects that contravene, that are, you know, expanding settlements. Recent days, there's been but a bunch of controversy over that. Uh, go back historically, Canada Park, that tens and tens of millions of dollars that JNF Canada raised was on the remnants of three Palestinian vill villages conquered in the 1967 war. Uh, you have uh, groups like Christian Friends of Israeli Communities that says openly that it, that it provides uh, financial support to the Jews currently living in biblical is Israel, the communities of Judea and Samaria. Um, so again, there's a whole bunch of these charities, almost certainly into the millions of dollars, going into projects in one way or another, indirectly or directly, support uh, settlements in the, in the West Bank. Similarly, with racist organizations. Uh, the Jewish National Fund of Canada is an explicitly racist organization. Until very recently, it was in its Twitter tag. It, it, it gets land, uh, holds land for Jews, excludes non-Jews from the land. This is, this is a form of racism that we criminalized in this country seven, 70 years ago. There's a famous Supreme Court decision that, that outlawed racist uh, property deeds, land deeds. Uh, in Canada, and yet here you have the Canada, uh, the Jewish National Fund practicing this type of policy in Israel today as a registered uh, uh, Canadian charity. So, so there, there's, and I, I'm sure if you go into the different charities and a real investigation into the, all these charities supporting projects in Israel, you'll find that a number of the other ones are engaged in explicit uh, uh, racism, and almost all of them are engaged in in implicit racism, because. Almost all this quarter billion dollars in 2018 that was raised for, for uh, projects in Israel, almost none of that goes to people who are the poorest people, like because ostensibly this is about charity, right? It's about like poor people, right? 
Well, almost none of that money goes to the poorest people under Israeli control. Obviously, basically none of it goes to people in Gaza, the poorest, and basically none of it goes to Palestinians in the West Bank. And even within Israel proper, the, the, about, about the half of the poorest people within Israel are Palestinian citizens of Israel. And I guarantee you that very little of this money being raised in Canada for charities in Israel are going to Palestinian communities within Israel uh, 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 proper. So the whole enterprise of, of, of uh, charity donations is, that Canada is involved in and that we're subsidizing is itself a racist uh, 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 enterprise. But you don't even have to go into all of that. Just, just at the direct level, again, it's contrary to Canada Revenue Agency guidelines to support another country's military explicitly. It's contrary to be supporting projects in the West Bank that, that contravene Canada's policy, that contravene international law. And according to uh, Canada Revenue Agency guidelines going back to 2003, uh, they promote, ra promote anti-racism, they don't promote racism. So it should be contrary to Canada Revenue Agency guidelines to support uh, uh, racist uh, uh, organizations. And yet, um, uh, this is, I guarantee you, millions, almost certainly tens of millions of dollars today of Canadian uh, 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 charity money is going to projects that contravene Canada Reven Revenue Agency guidelines that are currently on the book, let alone bringing into question this whole thing. Why? Why would Canadians be subsidizing donations to a country that has a GDP uh, basically equivalent to Canada's? Are we, are we subsidizing donations to hospitals in Sweden and Japan? Of course not, right? Is Israel subsidizing donations to Canadian hospitals and Canadian uh, guide dog uh, societies? Of course not. So why is Canada doing that for Israel? And this is almost not discussed at all by the pro-Palestinian movement, but from my assessment of things, this is Canada's most significant contribution. This goes back decades and decades, a contribution to uh, Israel's ongoing uh, uh, dispossession of Palestinians and strengthening Israel at the expense of, of Palestinians. Um, now, just quickly, I do want to go back historically and I wanna make it really clear that Trudeau's policy has been decidedly anti-Palestinian. Harper's policy was decidedly anti-Palestinian. We we're moving it. We've been moving in the wrong direction in the last 15 years, um, but it didn't begin there, right? It, it's ebbed and flowed. We can get into that in the question period if people want. It's ebbed and flowed to a certain extent, but the most significant Canadian contribution to Palestinian dispossession uh, took place in 1947. Canada played a central role with the uh, United Nations to, uh, discussions about the British mandate when Britain brought the mandate of Palestine to the international, the newly created international body. Canada played a, a central role in shaping the partition plan uh, uh, and in shaping the United Nations uh, Special Committee on Palestine that was uh, sent to the region to determine uh, Palestine's fate. So uh, Lester Pearson, Canadian, who later becomes Canadian Prime Minister came, and later becomes Canadian Foreign Minister, played a, played a, a, um, a led the, uh, the first committee on, uh, on Palestine, um, uh, which, which d d defined the uh, parameters of the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine that would be sent to, uh, to the region to come up with a proposal to what to do with the British uh, mandate. And, uh, and Pearson was, was a open, openly pro-Zionist from a few years before, and he did everything he could to facilitate uh, a pro-Zionist uh, uh, United Nations Special Committee on Palestine, which Palestinians would, would, uh, would, uh, would, would boycott, uh, at least initially, because they, wh why, were, why were representatives from Canada, Guatemala, Yugoslavia going to determine their fate? They didn't, they didn't see any reason why it was up to the, U the UN to, to come up with, you know, to, to decide on their land. Um, and uh, it was a Canadian, um, Ivan C. Rand, Supreme Court Justice, who was part of the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine that went to the region to come up with a proposal. He's considered the lead architect of the partition plan. And, uh, and at one point in the part when he was drafting the majority report in favor of the partition plan, he actually suggested giving more of Palestine to the Zionist movement than even the Zionist movement was asking for. 
Um, and ultimately, the partition plan uh, gave a Zionist movement about 55% uh, historic Palestine, despite uh, the Jewish population being about a third and uh, owning less than 7% of the land. So from a Palestinian perspective, this was incredibly unjust. When the United Nations Special Committee of Palestine uh, came back with their majority and minority report, uh, Lester Pearson, again, at the ad hoc committee, uh, Special Committee One, uh, Lester Pearson played an important role in the negotiations to basically get the British, or sorry, the, the Americans and the uh, Moscow and Washington to agree on the, uh, on the partition plan and to, to, to support it. Pearson could, care, could have cared less about the perspective of the indigenous Palestinian population, uh, he just cared about getting an agreement between uh, Washington and, and, and Moscow. And it was reported on the front page of the New York Times. Pearson was referred to as uh, uh, Lord Balfour of Canada for his role in, in, in pushing, uh, pushing Zionism. And, and what the, the, uh, the partition plan, which Canada backed, and um, the, the uh, the uh, only uh, uh, Middle Eastern affairs expert at external affairs at the time, Elizabeth McCallum, she said that we supported the partition plan because, quote, we didn't, we didn't give two hoots for democracy. And at the time, she, uh, uh, she sent a note uh, when, uh, during the negotiation, she sent a note according to the book, The Rise and Fall of the Middle Power. McCallum scribbled a note and passed it to, to Lester Pearson saying the Middle East was now in for 40 years of war due to the lack of consultation with the Arab countries. Of course, as we've seen in recent days, it's not 40 years, it's even longer, but McCallum was clearly uh, 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 much more uh, uh, force, farsighted than, uh, than, than, than other uh, officials. And basically what the partition plan did is it gave the Zionist movement diplomatic legitimacy to ethnically cleanse Palestine, to drive out 700,000 plus Palestinians. Um, and it sort of legitimated that, that, that project. Um, and there were Canadians that fought, a uh, minimum of 300, according to the lead uh, recruiter in, in Toronto, uh, uh, Ben Dunkelman, uh, he claims that he recruited as many as 1,000 people, can, uh, Canadians, World War II veterans, so generally highly skilled uh, military people, to go fight uh, uh, on, on behalf of the Zionist movement, and they participated in the, the ethnic cleansing of, uh, uh, of Palestine. And so Canada's role at the UN in 1947 is the most important Canadian contribution to Palestinian dispossession. Like I said, that has ebbed and flowed uh, over the years, but as we see today, we have a government, uh, Justin Trudeau, that continues to pursue a whole series of different measures. Even if Justin Trudeau uh, 10 days ago would have come out and said uh, Israel's ethnic cleansing in, in, in uh, East Jerusalem is wrong. Uh, uh, it's uh, attacks on Al-Aqsa Mosque are wrong. It's bombing of Gaza are wrong. Even if it was strong language, Canada would still have been uh, directly uh, enabling and complicit in his, Israel's uh, 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 human rights violations. And he didn't even make those statements. So we have a government and it's up, it's up to us to change that and to mobilize political power, to choose uh, important uh, 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 points of pressure within Canada uh, that we can, we can uh, take that outrage, the outrage we've seen online on the streets in recent, in recent days and direct it at uh, challenging Canada's complicity in uh, Palestinian dispossession. Uh, I'll leave it at that and pass it over. Thank you. You're muted, Bianca. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eve, for that, uh, that broad overview. True to the title of this event, it's very difficult to fit all of that information into just a few minutes. Um, but if you'd like to find out more about uh, Trudeau, the Trudeau government's uh, complicity in Palestinian dispossession, both historical and current day, um, definitely uh, check out Eve's writing at eveanglo.com. Um, so thank you for that and also for reminding us to just to use the power that we actually do have. So we'll, uh, we'll see you again in the Q&A Eve. And I just want to remind everyone at home uh, to post your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we're going to try and take as many of them as we can after this. So our next speaker is Karen Rodman, um, who uh, is a human rights advocate and founder of Just Peace Advocates and Palestine Just Trade. 
Uh, Karen was ordained as the United Church of Canada minister in 2015 and has served as a human rights volunteer observer in Palestine to the World Council of Churches. Karen is retired from a three-year decade uh, in senior management leadership in the Ontario Public Service. And Karen is uh, an incredible activist. Welcome, Karen. Thanks so much, Bianca, and uh, what an honor to be here. Um, I'm pleased to share a little bit more about some of the practical things that people are doing and can uh, do in regard to uh, ongoing campaigns. And I'm going to start by talking about the uh, illegal Israeli military recruiting in, uh, in Canada. Um, under the Foreign Enlistment Act, it is a crime in Canada to recruit anyone for a foreign military, and uh, Eve's talked a little bit about this. It's also a crime to aid and abet such recruitment, um, and there's indication that at any point uh, there are about 200 Canadians serving in the Israeli military. Um, based on uh, historic information. The only exception would be if the recruitment was of an Israeli citizen who's required to do mandatory service, and that would be someone who is not a Canadian citizen. The campaign to stop illegal Israeli military recruiting was launched on uh, October 19th, 2020 um, by both the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute and Just Peace Advocates along with the Montreal-based organization Palestinian and Jewish Unity. Um, it was launched with a formal legal complaint uh, with a call to Minister uh, Lametti, Justice Minister Lametti, to undertake um, an investigation and lay charges uh, as warranted. Le Devoir ran an article that day, and the following day, uh, the journalist from Le, Le Devoir who'd ran the article asked a question at the press conference of Minister Lametti about the actual complaint, along with evidence and a letter that had been signed by more than 170 Canadians, including uh, several prominent individuals from Canada and beyond. Lametti indicated at that press conference that he would refer the case to the RCMP and Marie Vastel at the Le Devoir ran this news on the front page of Le Devoir on, uh, on October 20th. I must say that the uh, Francophone media has been much more kind to uh, our advocacy work than uh, the English media, although some things have been changing over the last few days as I'll come to uh, in a few moments. Um, in early November, the RCMP indicated they did open the investigation and the original evidence that uh, had been provided by our our organizations to Minister Lametti um, were uh, provided to the RCMP. We provided additional information um, uh, early in 2021. All this information is on the Just Peace Advocates website as well. The RCMP have not followed up other than to just provide indication that the investigation was opened. However, subsequently, people have really engaged in the campaign with more than 2,500 letters going to Minister Lametti and other elected officials, and about 1,000 letters uh, going to the RCMP. We did hold a webinar by our organizations in early uh, February. World Beyond War joined us with that, but over 50 organizations uh, from across Canada, but also some international, came on board to fully endorse the campaign. Um, we'll be providing the link for that webinar in the chat in case you didn't have a chance to hear it or want to listen to it again. But uh, maybe more importantly uh, is that recently NDP member of Parliament Matthew Green from Hamilton Centre, in fact this was just following the um, NDP convention where a resolution was passed uh, in support um, of uh, Palestinian uh, activism or Palestinian action, I should say, related to um, military embargo and uh, settlement goods. Just following that, anyway, Matthew Green sponsored a parliamentary petition that is calling on Minister Lametti to undertake a thorough investigation and lay charges were warranted. Um, we just uh, checked the, uh, the petition before we came on. I think it's over 6,600 Canadians have signed the petition. It is just growing by about 100 every time we look at it. I encourage you, if you have not already done so, to sign it and uh, to share it within your networks. Let's make this the Palestinian um, or, uh, motion that actually, or not motion, parliamentary petition, I should say, that actually gets to the 10,000 signatures. So again, that link has been in the chat and I think it'll be put back in again. Um, 
Also, as Eve mentioned, there was a recent letter from our organizations to the minister. Well, I guess Eve more mentioned that uh, there was uh, indication around uh, the charities and using charity uh, funding uh, towards military uh, 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 military in uh, Israel, along with uh, the Foreign Enlistments Act that I've just been talking about. And so we do have a letter that is going to the Minister of Justice, Global Affairs and Finance that's calling on Canada to follow its own laws. And there's been about 2,600 letters that have been sent in the last few days um, in that regard. So again, that's something, in fact, you don't have to be in Canada to participate in that. Anyone can, uh, can send letters uh, as they wish. So I do want to spend just a couple of minutes and uh, talk about the groundswell of reaction that both Jonathan and Eve have spoken to in response to Israel's blatant violence and in particular Canada's complicity. Um, a Twitter storm was held by Canadian organizations. It'll be two weeks, I guess, tomorrow. It was the day after Al Quds Day and the attack on Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, and that saw over 1 million impressions in the hour that we were on Twitter. A letter was provided at that time by Just Peace Advocates for people to send to the Canadian government. And within a couple of days, we had over 14,000 letters that had been sent. Um, over the next few days, a letter from the National Council of Canadian Muslims resulted in over 100,000 signatures. And as far as I know, that's the first time that uh, NCCM, uh, the National Council of Canadian Muslims, has engaged directly in the issue of Palestine in, in this way. Other organizations, including Palestinian organizations, uh, CJPME, Independent Jewish Voices, and uh, Justice for All, followed a suit with a letter writing to the Canadian government around holding Israel accountable through things such as call for sanctions and emergency debate at Parliament and so on. Within a few days, and I count it sort of a few days into that week, Canadian elected officials had seen more than 150,000 direct calls into their email inboxes. And uh, by then there were phone banks happening with uh, phone calls. I'm sure it would be fair to say that at least a quarter million letters and phone calls um, have been made to, uh, to Canadian parliamentarians over this last 10 days as the momentum has continued to grow. On the streets, actions that were already in the planning for NAPCA Day became huge events with estimated crowds of up to around 10,000 in both Montreal and in Toronto. There were tens of actions all across the country with thousands coming out in Calgary, Edmonton, Ottawa, Vancouver, Winnipeg, Halifax, Mississauga and elsewhere. Um, in places where there is always uh, good support uh, for Palestine, like St. John's, Newfoundland and uh, Victoria, um, BC, the usual support was there, but it swelled with large numbers. And in places where there had not been actions, likely since the 2014 war on Gaza, or maybe never, actions sprung up, Guelph, Milton, Oakville, Saskatoon, and, and so on. Today, after the announcement of a ceasefire, um, CBC, Al Jazeera, CTV, uh, Toronto Blog, and, and many other media have reported on an action that saw red paint streaming from the Israeli consulate onto the street of Toronto to represent the blood of massacred innocent Palestinian civilians, the blood on Israel's hands, and a call to the Canadian government to end its complicity with Israel's war crimes. A few of you have been asking in the chat, and I know the link has already been provided, but um, over this coming weekend, there are actions planned for Charlottetown, Montreal, Toronto, St. John, New Brunswick, Surrey, Vernon, Winnipeg, Calgary, Edmonton, Kelowna, Ottawa, Powell River, Red Deer, Alberta, St. Catharines, and so on, and events later in the month for Victoria, London, and, and other places. So check out those events um, in, uh, in the chat. It's a list that includes Canadian events as well as uh, events from around the world. And we thank our uh, um, organization, um, Sammy Dune, the organization Sammy Dune for keeping this list current and up to date. So ECOS polls have over the past few years showed the majority, vast majority of Canadians support boycotts and sanctions to hold Israel accountable. And with this most recent blatant violence around across historic Palestine, 
the Israeli uh, bombardment and genocide of Gaza, the aggressive Judaism in uh, Jerusalem, the evictions in Sheikh Jarrah and other East Jerusalem communities, the attack on the sacred Al-Aqsa compound, the rash of military extrajudicial killings that have been happening across the West Bank, and the police and state-sanctioned state civilian violence against Palestinians in the 1948 territory has led people to be engaged uh, around the world, but engaged on the streets across Canada through direct uh, actions, as well as direct man's demands to the Canadian government. The ceasefire is not a reason to start. It's a reason for us to continue to build on this work. I do just want to mention that over the last five years, the Canadian BDS coalition has been providing quite focused campaigns through its about 25 member groups from across the country, as well as the coalition as a whole. The founding meeting of the Canadian BDS coalition happened in April 2016, and the notes record the following. The Canadian BDS coalition, a good, unequivocal name in answer to Trudeau's parliamentary motion in February 2016, condemning BDS and those who support it. I'm sure many of the people or most of the people uh, that are, are listening will remember uh, Trudeau being elected in uh, late 2015 and uh, by February bringing in motion uh, 14, uh, condemning BDS and those who support it. And uh, the response in Canada amongst the groups from uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, right through to Victoria, BC, um, was that we would come together and uh, work in this way. Shortly after forming the coalition work to create campaigns across the country and with strong international engagement. Um, the, one of the first uh, victories was uh, one that led Air Canada to end its contract with Israel Aerospace Industries. That's the main research development and um, an actual manufacturer of, uh, of, war, of the war machine in Israel. And it, um, Air Canada was um, ended a contract, a five-year contract in, uh, in two years based on the uh, on that campaign. More recent campaigns uh, with Quebec BDS, who also is a member of the Canadian coalition, was to have Hydro Quebec not renew a contract with Israel Electric and um, a campaign in 2019 that uh, the Canadian BDS coalition led that saw the Raptors not go to Israel after uh, it was indicated that they went by their owner uh, um, after their NBA victory. Um, 50 artists joined with the BDS coalition uh, just before COVID to say no to playing Israeli apartheid to Salon Dion. And there have been numerous other campaigns um, against Puma, Teva, many other companies, a call for an HP free zone, and most recently uh, working with uh, one of the member organizations of the coalition uh, in London, Ontario this week, uh, a, a company has declared itself apartheid free. So I encourage you to check uh, the website, bdscoalition.ca, learn more about campaigns currently underway. I'll highlight uh, just two very quickly. One is a current campaign uh, related to the Canada Pension uh, Plan Investment Board calling for divestment from the companies that it's invested in that are on the UN list as complicit with war crimes. Some people call that the black list as well as a Montreal-based company, WSP, that uh, um, is engaged in the light rail in East Jerusalem. A brand new campaign this week is one that is a call to the Dean of the Schulich Business School at York University to end their doing business in Israel seminar, which entails sending Schulich students, I suppose after COVID or maybe virtually now, to study in Israel for 10 days. There's a letter writing campaign over the last couple of days. I think we're up to close to 600 letters on that. So again, check out bdscoalition.ca or some of those are on our website at justpeaceadvocates.ca. Um, so in ending, Just Peace Advocate wants to remind you and remind that the Canadian government is a high signatory of the Fourth Geneva Convention and therefore is accountable under Article 1 of the Fourth Geneva Convention to ensure the convention is upheld under all circumstances. This means that Canada is complicit with war crimes when it does not hold Israel accountable and when it does not stand with international humanitarian law. Beyond this, under Canadian domestic law, 
the, um, the Special Measures or Special Economic Measures Act calls on Canada to take actions, including sanctions, when countries systematically violate human rights. There is a current call from the Palestinian human rights organization, El Haq, uh, that is an uh, organization that Jonathan Katab uh, founded in 1979 or co-founded in 1979. That campaign is hashtag time for sanctions. So time for sanctions. And the general secretary of El Haq, Shawan Jarbrin, highlighted yesterday the international community's lack of political will um, will will to hold Israel to account is what has allowed Israel to commit crimes against the Palestinian people as a whole, and that Israel's colonial apartheid regime established and maintained since the NAPCA of 1948 continues to deny the Palestinian people their, their uh, collective rights, including the right to self-determination and uh, right to return. So my party message is this that our role is to make it clear that Canada as a middle power needs to hold Israel accountable. And that means it is time for sanctions against Israeli war crimes. Thanks so much, Bianca. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much for that rousing call to action. It's incredible to hear about all the amazing activism in Canada and across the world. Um, and all the work that you and so many others have done uh, and the many ways that our audience members can get involved. Um, your level of engagement and solidarity is, is truly awe-inspiring. So um, we put a lot of the links to the different actions that Karen mentioned in the chat. So please check them out. Please, please get involved. Please take action. Um, we're now going to move. We have uh, less than half an hour for questions and answers. So we're going to get right to the Q&A portion of today's uh, discussion um, that concludes our presentations. And um, so, like I said earlier, you can put your questions in the chat. We've received quite a number of them and uh, we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. So the first question is from Rabia Khan and uh, the question is Eve, uh, can you give us a brief uh, overview of where the other Canadian federal parties stand vis-a-vis supporting Israel against Palestinians. Eve? Yeah, so <clears throat> the conservatives are, are, are you know, even more um, anti-Palestinian. They wanna move the embassy to Jerusalem and they, they basically, you know, just applaud whatever uh, Netanyahu is doing. Uh, the, NDP has been uh, more uh, kind of all over the place. Uh, what's happened with Jagmeet Singh over the past six weeks is probably deserves a, on the question of Palestine, probably deserves a couple uh, masters or PhD theses to d dissect um, because he went from complete, completely erasing Palestinians in a April 3rd, April 4th um, interview where he, in the, just before the NDP convention, where he was asked repeatedly about resolutions dealing with Palestinian rights and all he could talk about was anti-Semitism and he actually referred to anti-Semitism five times and didn't mention Palestine or Palestinians once. It was quite a, quite a uh, embarrassment that elicited quite a reaction. Um, but then the NDP convention passed a resolution that's a, you know, it's soft, um, but it was calling for an arms embargo on Israel and calling for Canada to uh, uh, block uh, trade with uh, uh, West Bank uh, settlement uh, products. And, uh, and uh, that passed overwhelmingly uh, at the convention. And, uh, and then uh, 10 days ago, uh, a couple of days into uh, the recent uh, flare up, uh, Jagmeet Singh um, held a press conference and then uh, asked in the House of Commons uh, Justin Trudeau whether he would bring in an arms embargo on Israel. So he went from a month earlier basically denying, effectively denying Palestinians even exist, to calling on Israel to bring it to uh, the Trudeau government to bring in an arms embargo. And then the next day after a press conference and bring in the House of Commons, then they put, then he put on an action alert calling on people to 
uh, engaged with the government calling for an arms embargo. And then they began, of course, fundraising off of, off of this action alert. Um, so it was quite a, quite a thing to see. Um, a good thing, you know, we, you can be cynical about these things, but it's obviously a good thing. It's, it was uh, due to a mix of outside pressure, uh, the fact that the convention passed the resolution, and then the fact that this, you know, recent uh, uh, violence and ethnic cleansing has gotten a, a lot of uh, attention and a lot of uh, mobilization online. Um, so there's room to be moving, and it's emboldened all the pro-Palestinian forces within the NDP. It's very much emboldened them. Um, uh, and it's affected the, the liberals. The liberal statements have gotten slightly better, right? Over the past 10 days, their, their positions got slightly better, right? They, not, you know, very far from where it should be, even at a rhetorical level, let alone at a more fundamental level, but, but uh, you know, slightly better. The Green Party has been, um, uh, they have a part, the leader of the party, Enemy Paul, is clearly a totally uh, extreme uh, uh, Zionist. Um, I wrote an article uh, two days ago about um, one of her, her, her senior advisor basically uh, claiming that Jagmeet Singh, that the Green MPs and all kinds of, you know, sort of everyone else who said anything pro-Palestinian was, was being anti-Semitic. Um, this senior advisor of, of the Green Party of Enemy Paul, um, just completely off of the deep end and to the point where they were calling for uh, they were going to, they were threatening to get rid of the Green MPs. This is a senior advisor of the Green Party leader publicly threatening to get rid of Green MPs. People can check that out on my website. Um, so the, ND, the Green Party has a good, relatively good policy on its books. Uh, and people may know there was a huge battle around that four years ago, uh, you know, almost split the party. Um, in recent days, the three Green MPs that are in the House of Commons have have said uh, critical things about uh, what Canada is doing. If called, referred to it as apartheid. Um, uh, so, so you know, the Green Party. I think most, the vast majority of members of the Green Party want to be challenging Canada's role in Palestinian dispossession. Um, they, they, but you have uh, a, a leader who is uh, clearly um, uh, totally supportive uh, of 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 Israel. Thank you, Eve. So the next question that we have, um, I think there's actually a few questions about it in the chat and also in the Q&A is, um, could any of the uh, speakers elaborate on Canadian arms sales to Israel? Karen? Well, go ahead, Karen. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I was going to turn it to uh, Eve, certainly um, in terms of the numbers, Eve, you probably have them uh, more quickly to us. I mean, there is both ways because we're buying arms as well. And I think we don't want to lose track of uh, the fact that we're buying Israeli technology too. So I'll maybe leave it. Yeah. With Eve. yeah so, so I think that officially it's only $17 million in arms sales. I think it was in, in uh, 2019. Um, that doesn't include the arms sales that Canada sends to the U.S., and that the weapons that, that would then go through the through the U.S. and Canada, um, about half of Canadian arms sales don't even get tracked, right? Because the the defense production sharing agreement with the U.S. that goes back like more than half a century. Um, so we don't even know, we don't even actually account for the weapons uh, in a public way of the weapons that go to the U.S. Um, and Canada is a major contributor of components to U.S. weapon systems, and that. Canada's, you know, Canadian companies are tied into the whole American uh, industrial, uh, military industrial base. Um, uh, the, the last report I've seen of comprehensive effort in, in going at that was done by uh, Richard Sanders uh, during 20, 2009, when uh, there was a uh, you know, terrible attack against Gaza and about 1400 Palestinians were killed. And um, Richard Sanders found more than, I think it was 140, 100, 140, I can't remember the exact number right now, uh, Canadian companies that were prov providing components. Um, there is more Canadian uh, purchasing of Israeli weapons, right? There's been uh, uh, different Canada purchasing weapon systems that were used in the, um, the apartheid wall that were uh, Canadian, uh, I think prison system that used some of that uh, technology. Uh, and Canadian companies have had uh, different uh, relationships because because Israel has a very high tech weapons uh, producing um, uh, 
you know, industry. And so Canadian companies have had a relationship like CAE have had important relationships with, uh, with Israeli uh, uh, weapons companies. Uh, but I think Jonathan might, wa might have wanted to add something there. Yeah, I, I wanted to add a more general point uh, uh, that, that doesn't deal only with the arms industry because usually with the arms industry, you're dealing with the real centers of power and that's where the connections are between the Zionists, the imperialists, the, uh, the one percenters. Uh, what is happening here is that the Palestinian uh, question is taking on the feature of really a genuinely global, moral, ethical situation where ordinary decent people cannot help but say that inequality is wrong, apartheid is wrong, discrimination is wrong, racism is wrong, uh, and yet, uh, even as we fight that battle for genuine moral positions, Israel and its Zionist supporters in Canada concentrate on the top 1% who have power. That is why even within uh, the, the NDP, you find it was the grassroots that forced the leadership to change its uh, position because the Zionists go to the top. They go to those who are in power. Now, you can get a, uh, uh, for example, a, a BDS resolution passed by the students in almost any university. But then you would go to the board of trustees and the president, and that's where the power really gets uh, exercised. Mm -hmm. so, so in a way, the Palestinian question has become a crucible or a, a model for how ordinary people can in fact impact and influence policies of their government. When, when those who are in power have no problem with Israel and what it's doing. And this is, this is the challenge uh, for us is how can we at the grassroots level create an impact so that morality, decency, human rights, international law, become part of the policy of the Canadian government at the top. Thank you, Jonathan. So the next question is- I just, uh, want, I just, want, to, I just want to add one other, one other thing that more important than the actual arms sales from Canada to Israel is that there is a publicly funded uh, Canada-Israel Industrial Research and Development Foundation, uh, which I believe got a, uh, an increase in its budget in the last, uh, in the last federal budget a few weeks ago. Um, I, I don't know exactly what amount, I forget the exact number, but it's into the multiple millions of dollars. And that basically subsidizes uh, relationships between Canadian and Israeli uh, uh, high tech firms, a bunch of which are military firms. The, the most comprehensive look at that that I've seen was a report going back, it's a, I guess almost a decade or a bit more than a decade ago. It's the Canada and Israel Defense, Industrial and Homeland Security Ties an analysis by Koli uh, Kelly Barda. And it goes through all the different uh, sort of um, uh, ties between Canadian and Israeli um, uh, arms firms and kind of high tech firms. Um, so I think that's actually more important than the actual specific number of, uh, of you know, dollars and weaponry going directly from Canada to Israel. Thank you, Eve. So the next question is from uh, Iman, who says, we know from recent surveys that the Canadian public is overwhelmingly sympathetic towards Palestinians. What will it take for Canadian politicians and parties to make this a key action point in their agendas? Is it just that the street has to be more vocal with the representatives? Will this be enough given the power uh, of the lobby over Canadian politicians? Well, this is a question for, for any panelists. This is precisely the point that I was making. Uh, is, is that when morality is on your side, when decency is on your side, when the people are on your side, how do you translate that into a policy? How do you translate that into uh, really pressuring, lobbying? First, you start with your representatives because they depend on you for, for, for the vote. And then you, you, you bring it up one level higher when you say this is illegal, this is a violation of your international obligation under Article One of the Geneva Convention, because you yourself then become the criminal 
who is violating international law just by allowing and enabling and emboldening Israeli actions that are contrary to international law. So this is really this is really the the crisis of of, of Western democracy is is how can the people regain power over politics and over their politicians? I, I think that the, the question of law is, a, is an important one, but I, I think that there are some simpler targets in Canada. And, and I think that the Foreign Enlistment Act, uh, the, the recruiting for the Israeli military in Canada, the fact that the support for uh, millions, tens of millions of dollars in support going for uh, registered charities that, that contravene Canada Revenue Agency guidelines with regards to supporting the Israeli military, with regards to West Bank settlements, with regards to racism, that's can Canadian law. And, and, and I think that one of the elements, these are pressure points that, that, that need, they're not gonna be won overnight. I don't think they're gonna be won overnight, but they're pressure points that are really important pressure points to mobilize on. And, and they also undercut the whole uh, Israel lobby kind of talking point, right? The Israel lobby's talk, one of their talking points is that we're, you know, we're singling Israel out. And it's true, we are letting, the Israel lobby be engaged in criminal activity at the Canadian taxpayer dying in many act in many cases, right? This, this is these are this is illegal. The United Jewish Appeal of Toronto and, and Combined Jewish Appeal of, of Montreal, back in June, they openly uh, promoted a webinar saying join the IDF in clear contravention of of. Foreign Enlistment Act. Same thing with the Israeli embassy in Toronto. So, so there's this, it also undercuts some of their rhetoric about singling Israel when we just say, no, apply Canadian law. So, so my, my, my increasing uh, formulation on this is, is, is that we need to be absolutely clear about what, about Zionist crimes, about what Zionism is. It's, it's, a, it's a movement of dispossession, a uh, European colonial movement that, that is a, a movement of dispossession and it you know, didn't start in 67. It didn't, you know, it didn't just start 10 days ago, whatever. This is about uh, a, a century or more long process of Europeans basically taking the land of, of non-Europeans. And Canada has been part of that the whole way through. And, 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 and that project to a large extent is a European colonial project. It, 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 would not, it would not succeed. I mean, there were Canadians that conquered Palestine in 1917, right? There was a Canadian general that led an initial attempt to, to capture Gaza. It was a first, it was a failed, but then there was you know, 400 other Canadians that fought with Allenby in, in helping the British conquer Palestine. So, so this, is, this is, we need to be clear about hard in our in our rhetoric if you like about what zionism is about the completely you know one-sided injustice but but quite simple and and if you want to call it mainstream in our demand just uphold canadian law just uphold canadian law i also think it's really important and it's already been said but just to remember that this week the shift um in the tipping point of when the you know organizations such as the National uh, Council of Canadian Muslims comes on board, and it matters about the votes and uh, the impact. As Eve uh, articulated really clearly around what role that had with the NDP and and how that uh, started to move forward. So there are uh, are moments, and I mean we're seeing that very much with uh, the mainstream media here in Canada. And I know Jonathan, you said that uh, the media in the U.S. is uh, is really focused. So it's how to use these moments really well um, as well too, right? So we have another question here, which is why does Canada support Israel so much? That's a very good question. Uh, I, 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 would, I would answer there are two uh, reasons. And one of them is collapsing uh, right now. Uh, one reason, uh, of course, is that there are specific interests, the government, the industry, the arms industry, uh, those who are in power uh, view Israel maybe as a, uh, an outpost of Western uh, imperialism. Uh, and, 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 and they support it for, for some uh, interests they have, banking interests, industrial interests, uh, etc. 
But, but the reason that most people used to support Israel had to do with their failure to understand its nature. They thought that Israel was a democratic country, that it was the only democracy in the Middle East. They thought that the religion or Christianity supports uh, the state of Israel and the Jews in their return to their historic land. Uh, they thought that Israel was a progressive, socialist, utopian experiment because they didn't know that it was actually a colonial movement taking over other people's land. Now, they used to talk about uh, a land without a people for a people without a land. Uh, so that there was also a lot of guilt feelings uh, about the Holocaust and about their own anti-Semitism and their own hatred for Jews, which they reflected by saying, okay, now let's give them the, the land of Palestine for their own. The absence of, of, of a Palestinian narrative. We were totally absent in, in, in the Canadian or the North American mind at all. Now, these, what, what I call these soft reasons uh, that, that, that led people to support Israel because they didn't know the facts and because they thought it was the right thing to do. These forces are now collapsing. As people see what is happening, as people begin to realize that Palestinians are human beings, that there is such a thing as Palestinians, that some of them are even Christians, not just Muslims, that, 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 that the fight for Palestine is a fight for humanity and humanitarian uh, values and human rights, not a fight for, uh, let's say, Western civilization against barbarianism and against anti-Semitism which is why I think it is so important that we have ethical, decent, principled Jewish voices standing with Palestinians. Because this is not, uh, this is not anti-Semitism. I wanna make it very clear. Anybody who supports Palestinians because they hate Jews, we don't want them. <laughs> they are the racists that we are fighting. We are fighting for equality. We are fighting for decency. We are fighting against racism, not for racism. So a lot of people now are beginning to see the picture. And as that happens, I think you will see uh, increasingly less support for the state of Israel and its policies and more support for, not just for Palestinians, but for decency, for equality, for human rights and for international law. Just to expand on uh, what, what Jonathan just said, a few points. One is that Zionism in Canada is not, doesn't begin as, a, as a, a Jewish movement. It began, begins as a Christian movement. There's an organized or semi-organized Christian Zionist movement in Canada for decades before there's any Jewish Zionism. The preeminent uh, Christian Zionist in the, around the time of Confederation, 1860s, 1870s, was a man by the name of Henry Wentworth Monk. And he lobbied uh, Balfour in, in England, and he was his some of his writings were read into the House of Commons, uh, uh, and he was calling for basically a dominion of the British Empire in the Middle East. So Canada was a dominion of of, of Britain, and he wanted another dominion of Britain of Jews in Palestine uh, as part of the British Empire. So Canada was the Canadian elite were obviously completely tied in with British Empire at that time. And as the British Empire increasingly saw in Zionism a way to uh, get more control over the Middle East, uh, particularly with the Suez Canal um, and uh, you know, sort of protecting this, their control of the Suez Canal, um, the you know, Canadian elite were very pro-Zionist. Like I said, Canadians helped conquer Palestine. There's a large amounts of money that are raised in Canada in the early 1900s, and particularly when the Balfour Declaration of 1917, large amount of money raised in Canada to support uh, European colonialism in the Middle East. Now, Canada has kind of got a unique uh, position in global affairs in that it was tightly tied to the preeminent colonial power, or imperial power in the world, British. And then during World War II, kind of really naturally shifts from the, the lead empire to the lead empire, going from the British to the American. 
And to differing degrees, both of those empires, of course, have been supportive of, 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 of Zionism. So, so Canada has, uh, you know, that force, and in recent decades, the fact that the U.S. is staunchly supportive of Israel has been an important explanatory factor in Canada's support uh, for Israel. Um, the fact that the there is a very well organized uh, uh, pro-Israel, uh, predominantly Jewish lobby. In Canada today, that is, you know, effective in in um, in uh, uh, pushing the government and other institutions into uh, 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 anti-Palestinian uh, policies. Um, you know, within that, um, they have uh, a very powerful tool that they use quite regularly, which is to basically beat back. Uh, those standing up for justice by saying, no, in fact, you're racists. No, in fact, you're anti-Semites. Um, and, and it's kind of a, a, a unique situation where they're riding on the coattails <clears throat> of empire. Uh, uh, they're also, I would say, the you know, uh, pro-Israel uh, lobby groups, people like you know, Heather Reisman and Jerry Schwartz or the Tannenbaums that you know, set up the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs because they felt that the Canadian Jewish Congress was not pro-Israel enough. Um, they also, they, 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 on one hand, to the riding empire, uh, they, they're, you know, uh, uh, among the, you know, the wealthiest Canadians, but then they also have a tool of claiming oppression in saying that those standing up for Palestinians are, are you know, racists or anti-Semites. So, so there is some unique dynamics at play in terms of, what gives the whole ethos uh, towards support, of, uh, support for Zionism. But it, 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 this goes back more than a century, right? The, the Zionist ethos of Canadian political life is not new um, and it's weakening, there's no doubt about it, uh, but it continues to be uh, you know, quite strong. Thank you, Eve. So we're, uh, we're nearly out of time. Um, there really are so many more questions. I think I'm only gonna take um, maybe two more and that's it. Uh, we have a question from Henry uh, Evans Sabrinka. What in your opinion should the labor movement be doing to support Palestine? Well, maybe I'll start, Eve uh, can jump, jump in. I mean, the labor movement was really uh, strong uh, in the early days after the civil society call for BDS um, in regard to uh, to uh, that support. And I think we're seeing some of that starting to come uh, as well. Um, I know for the labor movement, my understanding is that they really take their lead from labor in Palestine and uh, the unions in Palestine as well. So um, um, I'm sure Henry and asking that question knows probably better than, uh, than I or, or some of us on the panel even know in terms of labor work. But um, it, it's, um, yeah, really to be able to be working together with uh, uh, Labor for Palestine and with the unions uh, certainly, uh, uh, the uh, Canadian postal workers are amazing. Uh, they've signed on to uh, the um, the campaign related to the military, and pretty much every campaign you know that's being done, but is to move it into that. Uh, Sort of that next uh, level. I mean, if we you know, had the Canadian Labour Congress coming on board and other unions, but maybe I'll uh, I'll turn it over to Eve uh, on that as well. Well, I, I mean, we, we the Canadian La uh, Labour Congress put out a statement yesterday that was you know decent and went went in the right direction. Uh, CUPW put out a statement as well, you know, the right direction. I, I don't I don't see at all why they can't just say uphold Canadian, apply Canadian law around foreign enlistment and apply Canadian law around uh, revenue uh, uh, charities, right? They, 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 I mean, these are simple demands. The Canadian Labour Congress is, they're, what are they gonna be accused of? You know, like they're singling Israel out by saying we should apply Canadian law. Um, so this is, these are demands that, you know, I, I, I do think that they're, you know, I, I, the, the labor movement in Canada having connections with Palestinian unions and asking Palestinian unions, what do you want us to do? I get that, that makes sense. And it, there's, you know, C CUPW has done very good stuff on that. But I also think it's important, let's be, let's like take Canadian foreign policy seriously. Let's look really at how 
complicit we are here and how many different pressure points there are here. And there's no reason why a, you know, a union in, 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 in Ramallah, a trade union activist in Ramallah would necessarily know all of these different ways in which Canada is complicit in Palestinian dis dispossession. Why, why should they? Why would they? So the, you know, we need to be serious about understanding Canadian foreign policy in general and specifically on this issue. And there are so many pressure points sitting there. The Canadian, the Canadian Labour Congress says they support anti-racism. Why didn't they put out a statement attacking the Trudeau government for pulling out of a global conference against racism? That's an outrage. It, it passed without any mo any discussion. Why, why, is, why is there a special envoy to stop criticism of Israel? Why was that ever appointed? You know, the, labor, the, the, the Canadian Labour Congress and other unions around the NDP convention did some very good stuff on the IHRA uh, definition of, of anti-Semitism. That's some good work. They've done some good stuff on that. Um, you know, there's more, more to be done on, on that front. But, you know, when, when the Canadian ambassador is meeting with Canadians fighting in the Israeli military, it's completely appropriate for every single somewhat progressive-minded institution in this country to say, that's wrong. <laughs> and we shouldn't be having pizza parties for Canadians fighting in the Israeli military. That is not what the Canadian embassy in any country in the world should be doing, let alone while there's this occupation and brutality taking place uh, against Palestinians. Thank you, Eve. So, um, okay, so we're, we're nearing the end here. Uh, Karen, if you could very quickly tell us, is a question for you. Can you tell us how the actions that have been discussed here today fit into the call for BDS? Yes, well, um, yeah, for sure. I mean, we've talked about a lot of actions, so it's hard probably to summarize, but certainly uh, in terms of uh, boycotting specific uh, specific goods um, uh, that um, would be, or companies. Um, divestment is something we haven't done as much in Canada, and that's why this campaign regarding the Canadian uh, pension plan uh, is really important, because that's really starting to set the stage for actually a call to, uh, our public pension plan to not be investing uh, um, our pension into uh, into into war crimes, right? So that um, is good. A couple of uh, organizations like churches have passed divestment motions, but we we talked about earlier um, in regard to political parties and many institutions, these things get passed, but then uh, there are other influencers, so they never actually get implemented. So um, divestment is an area we need to uh, be working on. Um, sanctions, um, I mean, the call is getting clearer, as I said, around sanctions for the Canadian government. Uh, Just Peace Advocates, since we uh, came together three years or so ago, we've been trying to uh, really put the idea of a call for sanctions under the Fourth Geneva Convention and Article 1, as I referred to uh, earlier, as well as other Canadian law, including the uh, Special Economics Measure Act and, and other laws as well. So uh, it's that that stage uh, to call uh, Canada towards whatever sanctions that would be, whether it's military embargo or um, whether it's uh, sanctions until uh, the siege on Gaza is lifted. We had a campaign uh, in that regard called Gaza 2020. Of course, we're in 2021 now, so that wasn't realized, but that would be a strong call uh, to say, you know, sanctions, whatever form they would take until the blockade of Gaza was at least lifted. Um, and um, yeah, most of our work is boycott. Most of our work is boycott um, or in some way related to uh, calling for that kind of accountability um, and, um, and either be through letter writing or actions um, or following up directly with companies, sometimes from a legal context as well. Thank you, Karen. And the, the last question is for Jonathan. Was the ceasefire a victory for Palestinians? I think any time there is a ceasefire, it's a victory because human life and the destruction that goes with warfare, no matter who is the one who's dying or being destroyed, it's a catastrophe. So yes, ceasefire is a victory, I think. Uh, but, but in geopolitical terms, basically all the ceasefire did was saying that Palestinians continue to be on their feet, that they have not been totally crushed, that they have not been totally silenced. 
that they continue to exist and they continue to resist. I, I, I personally prefer nonviolent resistance. Uh, but, but we have to recognize that Palestinians are facing daily violence. The occupation is violence. The siege of Gaza is violence. Cutting off its water, its electricity, its, its supply uh, going in, going out is violence. The settlements are violence. Uh, Israeli actions in the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque are violence. In Sheikh Jarrah is violence. So yes, we have to stop violence and we have to resist violence. But it's not enough to just say, you know, okay, nobody is shooting. Nobody is dropping bombs anymore because there is ongoing violence. However, I, I have to say that many Palestinians feel that the fact that the Palestinians withstood this tremendously heavy bombardment uh, with, with, with uh, the, the most modern equipment and, and, and the most devastating bombs raining down from the heavens, from the sea, uh, from artillery uh, continuously on, on a helpless people who have no defenses, no air defenses, no air bomb shelters. The fact that they continued to exist and to resist Till the end, uh, I think many people will say it is a victory uh, for them. Al although, again, I think the real victory will only come with true liberation. And hopefully liberation will be good news for Palestinians as well as Israelis. Because we're not looking to destroy Israel. We are looking to destroy racism, to destroy apartheid, to destroy a system that dehumanizes Palestinians, as well as Israelis. We are looking for equality. That's all what we want. From the river to the sea, we do want equality. And, and this is uh, our, our message and that this should continue to be what we are about. This is a perfect moment uh, to call our discussion to an end. I can't thank you enough to our panelists for this lively, important, critical, timely discussion. So clear, so bold. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, Jonathan. It's been a totally extraordinary evening. Um, thank you for take, taking the time in your schedules on such short notice for this discussion. Um, and for calling on people here to use this info, take action. There were nearly 300 of us gathered here today um, in the Zoom room. Um, thank you for coming. We just have a few short announcements before we depart. Uh, if you like events like these, please consider making a donation to the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. We've been working relentlessly to help build a hub of critical Canadian foreign policy and are, are very reliant on our community to keep doing this work. So help us keep the lights on, help us continue building this critical hub of foreign policy action and analysis together. Um, that's foreignpolicy.ca slash donate. We have a lot, there's a lot of important actions coming up. Most of them are in the chat. Um, we actually also, I also wanna draw your attention to a new parliamentary petition that's just been launched and is being sponsored by MP Paul Manley to stop the government from buying 88 dangerous climate destroying warplanes that have a life cycle cost of $77 billion. Sign the petition link if you haven't already done so. Uh, take action. As has been mentioned many times today, one of the best ways that we can help protect Palestinians from Israeli violence is by insisting that our government apply its own laws with respect to both charities and foreign recruiting. You can send a letter to all MPs with one click uh, with this powerful action network tool it's in the chat we have a, a massive list of global actions we're seeing unprecedented solidarity and action for palestine let's keep the momentum going because as we know palestinians are far from free it's been a great event i can't thank you enough uh to to our presenters um thank you to our co-organizer uh, just peace advocates thanks again to our phenomenal panelists jonathan karen and eve it's been a terrific night and that's it for our program today. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. And thank you, Bianca, and thanks to our audience. Thank you.